The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, this is Ryan Helger with Excelsior Company. I just want to do a quick sound check here. Let me know if you can hear me uh, by typing something in the chat or question box. Let me, let me know you heard me. I want to go ahead and start in about 30 seconds or so. Thank you. All right, looks like we're good to go. A bunch of folks uh, responded in and they could hear me just fine. So we're going to go ahead and get started here. Um, let's launch this webinar here. This is the first in a series of webinars that we're going to be doing every month uh, with Excelsior here. Uh, there's different topics each month. Uh, so I will show you all the upcoming topics toward the end, end of the presentation today. But the very first one is connecting gas furnaces with a specific focus on the modulating gas furnace. If you have questions as we're going, just type them in that question chat box, uh, and then every 10, 15 minutes or so, I'll pause to go over there and look at it to see if any questions can be answered on the fly here. Uh, additionally, I'm going to be recording this webinar, uh, and I'm going to start that recording now, and then in the next couple days, it'll be posted online for you to, to view. All right, so first things first, the most exciting part, which is model numbers, which I know everybody loves. Um, all of the condensing gas furnaces from day and night uh, start with a G or an N model number. G is the main product line, so it's the ones that had the variable speed motors and the ECM motors and so forth. Uh, there are two models that start with an N, and I'll show you those individually. Uh, and those are the baseline entry-level condensing furnaces, if you will. They have a little bit of look difference to them on the sheet metal, and obviously some features that are different, and I'll explain that as we go. Uh, the second digit of the model number is a 9. That means this series of furnaces Furnaces are 90% efficient or better. Uh, specifically, they range between 92 and 98% efficient. Uh, there's another series of furnaces that would start with an 8 or have a second digit of an 8, and those would be the 80% furnace line. Uh, the third digit um, is M in all cases. For the condensing furnaces, it means the furnace can be installed in a multi-position. Um, and you see there's no other choice for that digit right now because every single condensing furnace that day and night makes can be installed upflow, downflow, horizontal left, or horizontal right. So every single furnace, every single size, every single model is four-way multi-poise. The fourth digit uh, is an indicator to you of kind of what, what tier of unit you're working with, really. Uh, so if it's an A, it's the modulating gas furnace. There's really only one model that's going to be in that, uh, in, or one model family that's going to be in that category. Uh, v means it's variable speed. X means it's an ECM motor. And S means it's just a regular entry-level, you know, single-stage type unit. Um, the most exciting digits over here towards the end, the heating capacity, the 080 on this example, tells you the BTUs of the unit that you're working with. So 080 is 80,000 BTUs, 100 is 100,000 BTUs, and so on. Uh, the next set of digits is the width, so 14, 17, 21, or 24-inch width cabinets. And then towards the very end, uh, you'll get two digits to express the airflow capacity of the blower of the furnace. So in this case, it's a 14, which means it can do 1,400 CFM, which is basically like a three and a half ton unit. So specifically looking at the different, different options of furnace available here, you can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six different families of furnaces, and then with, within each furnace family, there are numerous different sizes available. Uh, the very first one is the G9MAE. Um, some of you may be familiar with the furnace line that we had uh, last year, and the G9MAE replaces the G9MAC. Uh, so it's slightly different, basically some changes to the heat exchanger and so forth. Um, this furnace uh, is 97% efficient in all sizes, except for there's one size that is 98% efficient. Basically, it's so they can market it that way, is what I would probably tell you. Um, but generally speaking, it's a 97% efficient furnace, unless you happen to have the one special size that's a little bit better. Uh, the smallest size is 60,000 BTUs. That's because you're going to find that this is the modulating gas furnace, so it can be used when you have a little bit smaller loads, like 40,000. You could put a 60 on the 40,000, and it could modulate down a little bit, although generally we discourage that. Uh, and the largest size will be 120,000 BTUs, so 60, 80, 100, 120, and 20,000 BTU increments. 
The next column down there uh, indicates that it's a communicating furnace. And we'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end of the presentation today. Uh, but communicating means that it can communicate to a controller on the wall in lieu of a thermostat. So basically a thermostat that's a communicating thermostat. So it's not just going to give you your normal G, Y, and W type signals. Uh, instead of doing that, it's going to send a communicating signal from the wall controller over to the furnace to tell the furnace how far you are from set point, how much heating capacity it might want to modulate the gas valve, uh, and some data like that. And additionally, it can control some of the condensing units that way. Um, all the heat exchangers on the current 90% condensing furnace offering from day and night are aluminized steel heat exchangers on the primary. Uh, we'll talk more about the secondary later, um, but they all are aluminized. Uh, the G9 MAE is a modulating gas valve, meaning that it, the valve can go from 40 to 100% in 1% increments. So it's basically like a 61 stage furnace if you want to think of it that way. Uh, and as we go along later on in the presentation, we'll kind of explain what that's going to mean in terms of how it controls, what kind of comfort you might expect, and so forth. Uh, but 61 stages is quite a, quite a bit of stages to work with. Um, the blower on that unit is a variable speed ECM blower. Uh, ECM, as many of you know, stands for electrically commutated motor. It's basically a uh, direct current motor that is digitally controlled, so we can tell it what speeds we want it to run at. Uh, and that's exactly what we'll do with this variable speed furnace here. We'll dictate the speed that we want it to run at in conjunction with how we modulate the gas valve. Additionally, it doesn't show it on this chart here, but the inducer motor on the gas side is also an ECM motor um, with variable speed control. So we're going to modulate the gas valve, the inducer motor, and the blower motor in conjunction with each other to get the right capacity and the right combustion, if you will. And then the warranty on, on this particular furnace is a lifetime warranty on the heat exchanger for the original owner of the home, or original owner of the furnace, I should say. Uh, if you sell the house, it becomes a 20-year uh, limited warranty. Uh, and then it's 10 year on the parts. And in all these cases, this is assuming that you or the homeowner are filling out the registration paperwork. Otherwise, the warranties are a shorter duration. The second column uh, of furnaces here is the G9 MBE. This guy replaces the G9 MBT, once again, with just a difference to heat exchanger design. Uh, it is 96% AFUE in all sizes and all orientations. So upflow, downflow, horizontal, still 96%. And then everything from 40,000 up to 120,000 BTUs, 96%. So kind of the nice thing about this product line, actually all six of these, um, well, except for the very first one, they're all the exact same efficient for every size that, that's available. So it makes it a lot, a lot easier to deal with these when you're talking about rebates and tax credits and things like that. You don't have to sit there picking apart the product data manual to figure out well, if I have this size and this orientation, oh, it's not 96 anymore, it's 94.9. We don't have to deal with that anymore. Um, it's 96% in all cases, 96, 96, 95.5, and 92.1. The only one that's different is one special size of that G9 MAE that's a little bit better than the 97 uh, that all his buddies are. But in any case, the second column still G, G9 MBE is also a communicating furnace. Uh, so it works just like the bigger, the higher tier one, the G9 MAE, meaning that it's a communication cable instead of a regular thermostat. Um, the only thing that's really different about this guy here is that it is a two-stage gas heating burner instead of a modulating gas burner. That's really the difference between these two furnaces. 1% efficiency and two stages instead of 61 stages. Um, additionally, there's also one smaller size that goes down to 40,000 BTUs. Um, the next two I'll talk about together here, the G9 MXT and the G9 MXE. These are basically the same furnace, same surface area of heat exchanger and so forth. They're both 96% efficient, all sizes, all orientations. They go from 40 to 120,000 BTUs and 20,000 BTU increments. The only difference between the two of them is that one of them is a two-stage, the G9 MXT, and one of them is a single stage, G9 MXE. Both of them have ECM motors, uh, but they're not variable speed ECM motors. They're what we call multi-speed or multi-tap. Uh, they're basically five-speed motors and we're actively controlling three different speeds. Uh, and later on uh, today, I will kind of explain the way we control them. Um, so it's not a full variable speed where we ramp it all the way up and all the way down. We go to very discrete speeds, but it is still better than a traditional motor in terms of control and efficiency. Uh, the last two over here, uh, the N-series, there's the N9MSE and the N9MSB. 
Um, the MSE is a 95.5%, once again, all sizes, all orientations, and the MSB is 92.1%, all sizes, all orientations. Um, they both start from 40,000 BTUs and go on up. The, uh, the N9 MSE does go all the way up to 140,000 BTUs. So for some of you that put furnaces into commercial applications a little bit larger sizes, uh, this would probably be the furnace that you would be targeting because um, those go up to 140,000. Um, both single stage, they both have standard PSC blowers, permanent split capacitor. Um, these are basically just the regular everyday furnace motors that we've used on furnaces for, I don't know, 15, 20 years or whatever it's been, or even more probably. Uh, so there's no efficiency savings on the electrical side with this furnace. Um, just a regular entry level type thing. Uh, the other difference on those two furnaces is the warranty. They do not have the lifetime warranty on the heat exchanger. It's just a 20 year warranty on the heat exchanger is still pretty good obviously. All right, so some of the main differences with these furnaces, uh, and by the way, most of these furnaces came out about a little about a year and a half ago, uh, and you know, starting in late 2011, uh, some of them were released in 2012, and then the last two, the MAE and MBE were just released this past fall. So we kind of trickled these out over time, but now the line is full and complete and the new day and night condensing furnace line is uh, is basically done. I'm sure they'll change something again in a couple of years. But um, so the main difference is compared to some of the old furnaces or to some of our competitors' furnaces, uh, all these furnaces are 35 inches in height, uh, whereas you know a lot of them are 40, 41, 42 inches. Um, so they're 35 inches in height. There are competitors that do have a furnace that size, so it's not super exciting, but it's certainly better than the tall furnaces. You can fit more stuff in there. You have more room to jam in humidifiers and UV lights and and uh, APCO air purifiers and whatever else you're going to stick in the ductwork. Uh, every furnace of every model number of every size is four-way multi-position, uh, so you can rotate them upflow, downflow, horizontal left, horizontal right. I will show you some of the things that you need to, I'll say, tweak if you are going to rotate these furnaces. Uh, the venting is extremely flexible. Um, the vent long, runs are very long, and we'll talk about that as, as well. Um, the door access is two doors um, with no tools required to gain, gain access, and I'll show you some photos of that specifically. Um, there are some nice service features I'll show you in a little bit with slide-out blowers and things like that. Um, the efficiencies are very high. Like I said, it goes all the way up to 98% efficient, although most of the units you'll be choosing will be 96 and 97%. I think I kind of already explained that, so we can kind of probably skip that slide. All right, so this is what the heat exchanger looks like. This is true for all of these furnaces that I've mentioned, all six lines of them, if you will. Um, the heat exchanger was redesigned in the past year and a half, two years, um, basically for two purposes. One was to improve efficiency, which is a function of surface area, as many of you probably know. And then the other one is for uh, height reduction, to get these things down to 35 inches was kind of the target. Um, so it is a two-piece heat exchanger as our... Um, pretty much all condensing furnaces. Uh, the primary heat exchanger is on top here. This one happens to be a four cell heat exchanger that we're showing you a picture of. Um, and you would have four burners lined up with these four inlet holes here. So combustion will be happening here, blowing flame into the primary heat exchanger. I think you guys can see my uh, mouse, but if not, I will use an arrow thing here. Uh, hopefully you can see that. Um, so uh, combustion Flame and gas is going through the heat exchanger. It makes a couple of passes. On its way back through, it actually moves along the top here. It looks like it goes up and down, but the gas basically moves along the top. And this extra spacing, if you will, is to get more surface area uh, to help this guy out. Uh, then the gas will make a turn in the back side over here and then come through the secondary heat exchanger, which we'll talk about in a minute. So this primary heat exchanger um, is aluminized. Um, some of the older ones were stainless steel. Um, we're phasing those out. So the whole design is an aluminized steel. Uh, it's a clamshell design. It's something that has been used for decades uh, through the parent company of day and night. So it's a well-established primary heat exchanger. I've got to get rid of that little mouse thing here. All right, so on the secondary heat exchanger, which is the bottom half of this guy you see here, um, it is a stainless steel thin design, so the combustion that's going, gases that are going through this guy, through each one of these little tubes as you see down here in the bottom right, uh, those are all stainless steel. 
uh, but it is a fin and tube design. Um, so the fins that are hanging off of here are actually aluminum. So it's stainless steel tubes with aluminumized fins. Um, and the whole purpose of the fins is to get more surface area, to get more heat transfer, to boost efficiency. Um, so just like with condensing units, most of you probably have noticed in the past, you know, five plus years or so, that condensing units started getting really, really big. And a lot of you probably blame that on R410A, which it's actually just a coincidence that R410A started becoming popular at the same time we started making these things more and more efficient, 13 sear and up. Um, so a lot of these big heat condensing units are large because we needed more surface area and heat exchanger, which is why you need two guys to install one nowadays. Um, but to get more surface area is the best way for any type of HVAC product to get more heat transfer and hence better energy efficiency. So that's why we got a fin and tube style design on this here. The fins are really giving us the surface area that we need. Let's go to some of the more photo type stuff. Um, the width of the cabinet, I mean, I said before in the model number that there's 14, 17, 21, and 24 inch, but obviously every size is not available for every furnace. Um, you're not going to get 120,000 BTUs and shove it through a 14 inch cabinet. That's just not going to happen, obviously. Um, so here just gives you an idea of what's, what is typical. Um, if you do have the application for skinnier furnaces, 14 inch wide furnaces for like condo replacements and things like that, they're typically available in 40 and 60,000 BTUs. You typically don't need larger BTUs on furnaces that small because, like I said, it's usually a condo job and there's not a lot of condos that are so massive they have a 120,000 BTU furnace. Uh, likewise, on the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, we don't waste our time trying to put 40,000 BTUs through a 24-inch wide cabinet because the airflow would be too high and it would cause the discharge temperature to be too cool. So you can see there's going to be discrete sizes. Sometimes you'll find a size that's available in multiples, like a 60,000 can come in a 14 or 17-inch cabinet. An 80,000 can come in a 17 or 21 inch cabinet, so you do have a little bit of flexibility to work with there. As far as all the services go to these furnaces, and right now I'm still talking generically about the entire condensing furnace line. Uh, in a little while we'll talk more specifically about the modulating gas, but right now I'm talking generic. Uh, everything I've mentioned so far applies to the 92% all the way up to the 98%, uh, single stage, two stage, and modulating. Uh, but all the services coming into the unit are basically available on every side of the unit. Uh, so by that I mean I can have the gas connection on the left side or the right side, electric left or right, combustion air left, right, or top, vent exhaust for the, com for the combustion process left, right, or top, the uh, condensate drain left or right, um, the return air left, right, or bottom. So I have pretty much total flexibility on replacing this into an existing situation and trying to line up with the services that are already there, gas, electric, um, combustion, condensate, return air, etc. We'll talk more about each one of those individually in a minute here. This is what the furnace basically looks like. Like I said, it is a two-door design, so there's a top door and a bottom door. In both cases, there are just two quarter-inch uh, handles that you would turn to release the door. And once you take the door off, you're basically into everything. You do not need any nut drivers or screwdrivers to take any additional panels off. That's both true on the bottom, where I have my fan and electrical connections. Uh, once I take the bottom door off, I am in. I have direct access to the circuit board and all of my termination wiring. I don't have to take any other panels off. Same thing on the top. When I take the top panel off, I am into the combustion chamber. In fact, the top half of this furnace is the combustion chamber. Uh, it's a sealed vestibule or semi-sealed vestibule, and I'll explain that as we go. It depends on how well you seal it. Um, but once I take that top door off, I am into the combustion. I can see the burner. I can see the flame. I can measure things, test things, etc. I don't have to take another enclosure off to get to the burner. So here just shows you some of the services coming in. Uh, because the top half of this furnace is a sealed combustion chamber, the door is actually gasketed. Uh, additionally, when you make all your connections for vent, exhaust, gas, electric, and so forth, um, you do need to seal those up as well because if you don't, it's no longer a sealed chamber. That's why I call it kind of semi-sealed. It depends on what you've done to it. Um, but as you make a penetration hole in it, say you're going to bring in your gas line, uh, we ship with the furnace in the loose parts bag a uh, rubber grommet that would be installed on that gas line to seal up that penetration where the gas line comes in, right? Uh, and then the same thing with the combustion and vent there. I'll show you how those connect and seal. Um, so every time you bring a service into this unit, you're going to be using the factory supplied connector piece, whether it's a grommet or a, um, a uh, what I want to call it, a flange. Uh, for the for the piping uh, to bring things things into this unit. 
Uh, as far as the venting goes, um, right now this is an upflow furnace that it comes defaulted as. I'll show you downflow and horizontal in a second. Uh, but the furnace ships as an upflow furnace and it ships in this middle configuration here. So it's assuming that you want to have supply air coming in through the bottom of the furnace, uh, excuse me, return air coming through the bottom of the furnace, supplying out the top, combustion air coming in the top, exhaust air leaving on the top. If you don't like that, or more properly, if your project doesn't need that, you can start changing things. So if your services for combustion air and exhaust are already on the left side of the furnace or you're going to be going out the left side wall of this house, um, there is this vent elbow on here that you can rotate. And I'll show you a zoomed up photo of that in a second. You rotate that elbow instead of pointing straight up like the middle one, you point it to the left, and now you can vent out the side of the furnace to the left. Or you can rotate it right 90 degrees and vent out the right side. Combustion air can come in any side, left, right, or top. It does not matter. Um, once again, once the combustion air makes its way to the furnace, uh, assembly, there's no more combustion air piping because the whole top half is the combustion chamber. So the combustion intake pipe just makes it to the furnace and it does not continue on. Whereas the exhaust pipe has to leave this venting elbow to be piped out of the unit completely. If I were to flip this furnace upside down on top of its head and make it a downflow furnace, meaning the return air is going to come in now what is at the top of the furnace and discharge towards the bottom, uh, I got a couple choices on what I can do to vent it. I cannot leave it in the default position like we showed here on the middle one because that default position would want the combustion air to continue going down and we cannot go down with the uh, combustion and exhaust air. So I got to rotate something. If I rotate it to the left here, the elbow, 90 degrees, I can, I can exhaust out the left, take my combustion in that way. I can rotate it this way on the far right side, and exhaust out the right, take my combustion air in on the right. Or if I wanted to, I can rotate the elbow 180 degrees and then exhaust through the blower housing and out the unit. Uh, three cautions with this, I guess. One, if you're going to do it, you got to order the internal venting kit that goes with that, which basically gives you the grommet sealings to seal up these two penetrations you just made through the blower housing. Uh, the second thing is uh, keep in mind that you're going to be putting PVC pipe directly in front of the blower housing and circuit board that are with that, that section of the furnace, so it makes it a little bit harder to service. So you're really only going to do this if you have to kind of thing. And then the third thing is I just have a mental block in my head about running combustion air through the blower housing of the unit. So really you're only going to use this middle configuration if you're in some very tight downflow condo situation where you literally can't vent out left or right. And then there's the horizontal choices. You can go horizontal left or right with the airflow. And when you do that, you got some choices on what you can do with the combustion and exhaust air. On this left here would be the default shift position, right? Because this elbow would have been pointing towards the top of the furnace, which is now the left side. So I can exhaust out the left, take my combustion in that way. Or I can rotate it and exhaust out what is now the top of the furnace on this bottom picture right here. Can you guys see my mouse, by the way? If someone lets me know, type in if you can see my mouse moving around um, as I continue to point at stuff. Uh, or if I wanted to and I had to go out the right-hand side of this guy, which is now the bottom of the furnace. Oh, good. You guys can see the mouse. Great. Um, then what I could do is rotate the elbow 180 degrees, cut through the blower housing like I did in the previous drawing, order it with that internal vent kit which gives me the penetration sealing uh, options to, to pull air through that way. And then I can go right, which is just a mirror image of left, so we don't have to spend any time on that, really. All right, if anybody has any questions as we're going here, just feel free to type them in. Bob actually typed a question in, um, asking if there's pip pictures of what I'm talking about, and I'm assuming he typed that in before we started pulling some of these pictures up. So but there's basically a picture for everything I've mentioned so far. So if I haven't shown it to you yet, I will very shortly. Uh, it is possible and permittable to take combustion air from the attic space or from the uh, crawl space area of a home. Uh, the furnace, I should say, permits that. Sometimes local codes may or may not allow you to do that. And generally speaking, it's bad practice to steal air from these spaces because those spaces then become negatively depressurized relative to the outdoors, which means you start sucking crap in to those assemblies from the outdoors. So whenever possible, um, get all your, your combustion air directly from the outdoors. If you have to steal it from the attic or crawl space, the furnace, the manufacturer of the furnace, day and night, allows you to do that if you have to. And there's also allow allowances for taking air from the actual home itself, uh, but there are caveats with that also. So you can't, you can't take it from those spaces if you need to. These two drawings here show you that if you are going to take combustion air um, from, say, your attic, for example, we want you to be 12 inches above whatever is on the bottom of your attic. So a floor, piles of insulation, whatever it is, we want you to be a foot above that 
so you're not sucking in whatever's on the floor of that attic. Uh, same kind, kind of thing in a crawl space. We got some rules on we want the intake of the pipe to be three inches away from whatever is above it, or what, the bottom of whatever is above it, and then 12 inches above the ground. Um, so we're not inadvertently sucking stuff into the combustion chamber on accident. If you need to steal air from the home, and by that I mean um, you're not going to run a combustion intake pipe all the way to the outdoors. Um, we prefer you do it, obviously, because the air outdoors is generally um, cleaner and better for combustion than the air indoors. Plus, if you take air from inside the house, you are depressurizing it, which can cause other problems, such as backdrafting your water heater or your fireplace or something like that. Um, but in any case, if you want to take air from the indoor of the home, or, be, or if you have to because there's no real better way to do it, um, we do require that you put a little bit of PVC pipe on that combustion inlet, like this drawing is showing. We want 12 inches of pipe plus a 90 degree elbow on there. And the whole purpose of that is to generate a little bit of static pressure on the negative side of the fan. Uh, we need to have a little bit of resistance, if you will, to be able to generate that pressure differential. Uh, if we just free blow it, we're not going to get much, much air movement uh, through a, um, a blower style uh, housing. Uh, there are other ways to do it. You can put the PVC and then the 9-inch elbow. You can put the 9-inch elbow and then the PVC. It doesn't really matter. We're just trying to get some false resistance on that thing. Um, so that's how you would do that. Uh, only do that. Only do combustion air from the home if you absolutely have to. A um, couple notes about how the furnace ships um, because this has come up a couple times already. Um, the top of the furnace, the flanges on the furnace ship in the flat position, if you will. Um, and we do not want to leave them there. Uh, ideally, you'd be turning them up to make your duct connections to them. However, if you're not going to use them, we need you to turn them downward into the unit. We cannot leave them in the flat position because, as you can see, if I take a half inch and I walk around every side of this, and I subtract a half inch off, I've significantly reduced the airflow through the unit. Um, and if I already have, if I'm already kind of at the limit of its static pressure, like many projects are, it's probably going to cause the unit to have too low of an airflow, and it's going to cause nuisance trips on the high limits. Uh, for heating, um, as well as cooling airflow problems. So either bend the flat flanges up and use them, or bend them down and don't use them, but do not leave them in the flat ship position. The reason we don't ship them, ship the furnaces with them up, is because we found that when stacking furnaces in the warehouses at, around the country, uh, they tend to have more likely to be damaged when the flanges are up than when they're flat. It's kind of how that evolved. So here just showed you some pictures of that. Um, if you're going to use the flanges in an upflow configuration, great, bend them up, straight up 90 degrees, make your connection. If you're not going to use them, that's fine too. Bend them down, I'm just showing you here 120 degrees to get it out of the way. Do not leave it flat. Um, same kind of thing with downflow. You can either cut it off or you can bend it down out of the way. Either way is fine. Same with horizontal. All right, so that's the supply side. On the return side of the unit, um, all these furnaces can take their return air from the, the bottom, the sides, um, left side or right side. But it kind of depends on what configuration you're in and how much airflow you have. So if your furnace is in the upflow position, you can take the return air from the bottom of the furnace, you can take it from the left side, you can take it from the right side, or you can take it on a, any combination of those. Left plus right, left plus bottom, right plus bottom. If you're going to do the furnace in the downflow position, meaning you've turned the furnace 180 degrees and you're discharging air into the ground, um, then the only acceptable return airflow path is the bottom of the furnace, which is now the top because you flipped it upside down, right? So you cannot take any side air on a downflow application. Um, and then in a horizontal application, um, you could take air in the bottom of the furnace, um, which is now the side because you turned it horizontally, um, or you can take it from the bottom of the furnace, which used to be the side, if that makes sense. I'll show you some pictures of that as well. Um, the one thing I do want to note is that when you get to larger furnaces, specifically like four and five ton furnaces, uh, airflow-wise, um, you are not going to be able to get all of the air you need through just one of the sides. You're going to have to do some kind of combination or stick with the bottom, and I'll show you that here. So pictorially, what I was talking about in the upflow position, I could take my air in the left, I could take it in the right, or I could take it in the bottom, or I could take it in a combination of those. If I have 1,800 CFM, which is the factory recommendation, although some of us here in the office typically start recommending at 1,600 CFM or more. You cannot get all the air you need through just one of these sides, so you've got to do it all through the bottom or do both sides, which is not really feasible because now you've got return ducting on both sides of the unit, or a combination of side and bottom. If your furnace is in the downflow configuration like this right picture, air comes in this way, 
goes straight to the bottom. That's the only acceptable configuration. No return error on either side. And then if you're going to do a horizontal installation, the air comes in through what is the bottom of the furnace on the left-hand side in this drawing and goes straight on through, or it comes in from the bottom, which is the side of the furnace, and makes its way through. No return error on the top of this guy. If you're having larger units, 16, 1800, 2000 CFM, and you're not able to get all the air through a combination of side and return, and you only can take it in on one side, one of the things that we often recommend doing is putting a plenum box on. Um, there are several suppliers of these, including Excelsior actually manufactures these. Um, and they come typically in like four, five, six, and eight inch heights, depending on what your application is and what you're doing and what other features you want to jam in there. But the whole goal of this guy here is, is to get this furnace up off the ground and allow me to, from an application standpoint in your home, take all the return air in on the side of this guy. However, for airflow reasons, some of it's coming to the side of the furnace housing, some of it's coming to the side of this filter and moving into the plenum, which is the bottom of the furnace. So I'm really getting side and bottom return here. So this is one way for me to do all my return on the side inlet if I have too much airflow, 16, 18, 2000 CFM, and get it all done in one fashion there. So if you got larger furnaces, four and five tons, and you need help figuring this out, let us know, and we can help you select the different types of uh, return plenums to stick underneath this furnace to make sure we get the required airflow. And there's actually some cool ones that we make that have uh, filter racks in them and stuff like that too, if you're interested. All right, let's see if we got any questions. No questions right now, which either means that I'm boring the hell out of you guys or I'm so awesome that I just do a great job describing everything. I'm not sure which. You can let me know later on. Um, uh, for gas connections, like I said, you can take the gas on the left or right side. Here's a blown up picture of that showing you the grommet. The grommet is in the loose parts bag that comes in, inside the furnace there. So you'll make your gas penetration. You make your knockout, put your gas pipe in, put the grommet on, and then make your gas pipe connection. You can come out on the left side here, or you can go out the right side of the unit. Uh, if you go out the right side, what you're doing inside this cabinet is you're making a 90 degree turn, another 90 degree turn, and then the gas pipe is moving on out the right side of the cabinet. Uh, electrical, that's pretty easy. Uh, I think most of you guys can realize we can take electrical in from pretty much anywhere because wires are really easy to bend. So we take it in the left side or the right side. There's a little, uh, a little junction box that's mounted on the side of the unit. You can move it over to the other side if you need to. That's just kind of showing you that pictorially. I kept a lot of extra slides in here because I realized some folks may be watching this on video version later and want to refer to it. Um, but some of these things are fairly explanatory. All right, so um, if I got an upflow situation where my return air is coming in the bottom, my supplier is going out the top of the furnace, that's how the furnace ships. He's already in that configuration, so everything's ready for that. And by everything, I mean the condensate trap is in the bottom right-hand corner of the picture here. Uh, and we want the condensate trap to be on the bottom because most of you realize um, gravity helps water run downward. Uh, so we want the condensate trap to be the lowest position. Um, so in the upflow position, he's down here. The venting elbow is right here on the top. He's rotated to go straight up. And if I want to vent out the top, that's great. Everything is the way I want to do it. However, if I were to rotate this entire drawing I'm showing you 180 degrees, now the condensate trap wouldn't be in the bottom right-hand corner anymore. He would have rotated and been up in the top left hand which means that it's not going to do a good job of letting water from the condensate run down to it. So what you actually have to do is flip the condensate trap. I don't know if you can see in the left side drawing here. There's three little plugs here. Over here on the right, I would take my condensate trap off with two screws, take these plugs out, put the plugs where the trap was, put the trap where the plugs were, and basically everything would be ready to go. So I can flip those two guys. Same thing if I go horizontally and I were to take this whole drawing and rotate it 90 degrees to the right, I would have to leave the trap here but I would rotate him 90 degrees, which is why I got that other plug to move. So basically, I'm either flipping the condensate trap with the plugs or I'm rotating the trap in its place, um, depending on whether I'm going up, down, left, or right. If you're going upflow, it's already done. You don't have to do anything. If you're going to go horizontal or downflow, then you got to move stuff. Our market is probably 85 to 90% upflow in the Chicago land uh, area. Um, Minnesota is the same kind of thing. Uh, lots of basements there. Not sure about the guys down in Kansas City. Maybe it's a little bit different because there are some uh, slab on grade homes, but there's still a fair amount of basements. Uh, and usually if you're in a basement, you're in an outflow situation. Um, and then, of course, you got people that put their furnace in the attic, and then you're probably going to be horizontal. Uh, but most of the applications will be upflow. 
Uh, if you do flip this guy sideways um, to go horizontal on, on, the, on the left or right side, that trap is going to poke through or, if you will, penetrate through the side of the cabinet. Um, like this drawing is showing here, just like an inch, inch and a half. So two notes with that. One, there's a rubber grommet that you need to put on there to seal up that penetration, right, because you're making a penetration through our combustion chamber, if you will. And number two is you're not going to be able to lay this furnace flat on the ground in a horizontal application. You're going to need to hang it from the rafters or set it on um, blocks or something like that because you're not going to want to set it on top of this plastic trap. This is a uh, blow-up of that vent elbow I was showing you. Um, so by default, it's pointing upward, but if I need the vent left, right, or down, I can rotate it. It's very easy to rotate. I just loosen up what I'm going to call a radiator hose clamp, for lack of a better description. I loosen that up. I rotate this elbow with my hand, and then I clamp it back down. That's it. Uh, the second clamp over here is for connecting my PVC pipe later. So it's very easy to rotate this thing to go to go to have my exhaust air go up, left, right, or down. Um, you may, in your loose part bag, have a little choke that's shipped there. Um, it's for very niche situations. It's only on the entry-level furnaces, the N-series furnaces with the PSC blowers, and only on the 40,000 BTU motors, um, and if you have short vent runs. So generally speaking, you're going to throw that thing out. You don't really care about it. However, if you happen to be in that niche scenario, 40,000 BTUs in the Midwest with a vent run that's 10 feet or less, you got to put this little choke plate on there. And it's basically because the fan is going to be oversized for the situation, and we need to put that little choke plate on there to cause a little bit of false restriction to make the fan seem like it's more the correct size. Um, most times, it's not going to apply at all, but I mention it because it'll happen. There's a picture of it. It literally just snaps in. It's very easy. Um, so if you got a 40,000 BTU and it's in, in our climate zone, 20,000 uh, foot uh, altitude and less, and you got a short vent run, meaning you're going to poke out the sidewall of a condo or something, that's when you're going to have to put that guy in there. It's very easy to do. It takes one second. You take that elbow off, snap that, that, that uh, choke in, put the elbow back on. The condensate trap um, in this photo is clear. It is act not actually a clear condensate trap. Well, it's half clear, I should say. Um, the engineering team wanted to make it clear based on dealer feedback. Um, by the way, there's these, these teams of dealers they use throughout the country uh, for different products to kind of test them, check them out do some sample installs to give feedback to them so they can improve stuff. And one of those requests was to make the condensate trap clear so when there's crap clogged in it, we can see it visually that there's something stuck in there, uh, which is a fantastic idea. However, in some of the field trial sites, uh, homeowners started asking what the hell was in there, uh, and people didn't like that, that kind of questioning. So um, what the final result is, and what you'll see in the manufactured units, is that the front half of the trap is opaque, meaning that it's colored white or black, depending on the trap that you got, and the back half is clear. So the homeowner doesn't see anything, but the service tech, if he needs to see if the trap's plugged because he's having a problem, can take a couple screws out, take the trap out, look at the back of it and say, oh yeah, that's why. There's this piece of junk in there. Right? So that's why that's like that. Uh, here's just some zoom-ups of that trap, um, and it's just attached with a couple screws, and you'll be rotating it to different positions based on how you've decided to install the furnace. Once again, if it's upflow, you just leave, leave it as is. Uh, the condensate, by default, is ready to come out the right-hand side of the unit. I don't know if you can see here where my mouse is. That's where that condensate trap is. Yours will be there, except it'll be white or black face cover on it. Um, and then it's set up to, to go ahead and discharge right out the right-hand side of the unit. If you want to go out the left-hand side of the unit, because that's where your water connection to the sewer is going to be, or because you're replacing an existing 90, and that's where his condensate trap used to be, that's fine. Um, however, we give you this um, interesting shaped pipe that we call a Z-pipe in the loose part bag, because I don't know if you could see very well. Let's see if there's a better drawing of it. Here, yeah, this is probably the best drawing of it. Uh, the condensate trap is over here on the right where the red arrow and my mouse are. If I want to go out the right-hand side of the unit, easy, no problem. If I want to go out left, what's blocking me, right? I got these pressure switches in my way as well as part of this fan housing. So that funny-shaped Z-pipe, because we give it to you because we don't think anyone's going to be trying to bend PVC into this weird shape. Uh, it goes behind the motor housing and comes out and ends right about here. Um, and then you would have your field supplied PVC from right where my mouse or the red arrow is, actually right there where the end of the coupling is, on out the rest of the unit. So that Z-pipe just gets you behind the motor uh, in an easy fashion if you have to go out the left-hand side of the unit. All right, so venting 
Uh, the venting is phenomenal. Um, we can vent distances that we never even conceived as being feasible on a furnace in the past. Uh, basically, it's a function of the inducer motors. Uh, but this is the venting table. Um, this is for the N-series 90 percenters as well as the ECM controlled um, G-series. The modulating gas unit has a little bit higher length runs than this. Um, so this is conservative. So for sake of our discussion, we're going to say this applies to everything. Um, but there is one specific furnace, the modulating gas unit, that can actually go a little bit longer runs than this. But if we take, for example, and you can ignore the bottom half of this chart because that's 2,000 altitude and up. And as you go down in the tables, you would have gotten even higher, but we don't care about that. In the Midwest here, we only care about 2,000 and under. So if I take the typical, you know, 100,000 BTU furnace, if you will, if I look at this chart, it says, nope, you cannot vent it in one and a half inch pipe. You got to go up to two inch. And with two inch, you can go 25 feet of run, uh, of equivalent feet, which means the actual length of run plus any uh, penalties for elbows and fittings. And I'll show you the chart for those in a second. So if it's right near the sidewall, 25 feet, no problem. If it's going to be a little bit of longer run, I got to go to two and a half inch. Two and a half inch is not a very common PVC size, so it's not very cost effective. So three inch is probably cheaper than two and a half. So if I look at it that way, I can go 235 feet. If I got to go a little bit further, I can use four inch and go 265. Um, on the smaller sizes, if you look at, say, a 60,000, I can use one and a half inch and go 30 feet. 135 with 2 inch, 235 with 2.5 inch, 265 with 3 inch, and so on. Um, so you can see these vent runs can be quite long. And the whole purpose of this is to prepare for the future condo and apartment replacement markets when eventually at some point in time the 90% DOE rule actually goes into effect. Uh, and by the way, most of you probably know that was supposed to go into effect May of this year. It has been delayed. Uh, the DOE is going to review the process and then reissue a ruling. And it can be anywhere from, let's say, one to five years before it actually happens now. So it's not going to happen in May for 90% minimum. It'll be sometime in 2014 or to 2018, let's say. Um, but when that happens, these, these, these series of furnaces are already ready to handle those kind of applications. Now, getting the PVC running through your neighbor's living room is, is another challenge, right? But at least the furnace can handle the distance. The applications will still be challenging, obviously. Um, here's a shows you an example of the deductions table in the furnace. So when we say it can go 150 feet, for example, um, let's just do the one that's on here. Let's say that the maximum length from the table is 127 feet. If I had three 90-degree elbows, I would look at that and say three of these elbows uh, at, what did he use? He must have used a long, long radius, which is three foot of penalty. So three elbows times three foot of penalty, that's nine feet. And I got two 45s. The 45 was a uh, one and a half foot penalty right here, boom. So two of those times one five, that's three. So instead of 127 feet, I can really only go 115 feet. So the more elbows you put in, the more distance penalty it is. Because really, we don't really care about the length. We care about the, um, the static resistance of the inside of the pipe. And going in a straight line is much easier with less static than making a 45 or 90 degree turn. Those turns will have a big pressure penalty associated with making that turn. Um, so the more elbows you put in, the less distance you can go. And by the way, these distances are for each pipe. Um, so if it says I can go 265 feet, that's not a round trip of intake air through the furnace and back out. That's 265 feet away. So that's, I mean, 265 feet of exhaust from the furnace out of the house, um, you know, plus the inlet uh, distance, right? So it's, it's one way we're talking about here, not round trip. So it's, it's extremely long runs that you can do as a maximum. When you're going to connect these pipes to the unit, um, the connection pieces are supplied in the loose part bag with the furnace as well. Um, and this is showing you the um, four pieces that are involved with the exhaust pipe. And there's also some combustion pieces. Um, these pieces are notched. So these four notches that are on that um, coupling get slid over the adapter that's going to go on top of the furnace or the side. So on the right-hand side of the drawing here, that adapter, if we're going to exhaust out the top of the unit, that adapter would have a little gasket, and then we put the adapter on, screw it to the top of the furnace. Um, and we would put the coupling on, clamp the coupling down. Um, um, excuse me, put the PVC through, then clamp the coupling down, and then the other PVC would be going up the top. So I'd have one piece of PVC leaving this elbow from the inducer going up to this coupling, and then I'd have another piece of PVC going up my 200 feet. You can, if you want, run one piece of PVC all the way from 
the inducer motor all the way up to through the top of the house or wherever you're going with it. Um, however, we recommend that you cut the pipe in half and make the dividing line right in the middle of this coupling. That way later on, if you're going to service this furnace, if I did a one piece all the way from the inducer motor up and now I need to change out the furnace for some reason, I got to lift up 200 feet of PVC straight up out of this house, which is not really much fun. So you're much better off having the PVC from the outdoors terminate right at the middle of the coupling and have another you know one and a half foot piece going from the coupling to the inducer motor. On the combustion air coming in, there's another one of these adapter plates. It's a little bit different than the one on the right because the one on the right, the PVC goes straight through. The one on the left is smaller because the PVC comes and stops and terminates at that connector adapter because uh, it's just going to dump air into the top half of this furnace. It's not going to pipe it all the way to something. It just pipes it to the furnace and that's it. So you can see the one for the combustion air is a little bit smaller diameter uh, because there's a little lip on the inside of that guy, this guy right here, where the PVC sets inside that lip and then rests. Whereas the one for the right, for the exhaust vent, um, there is no lip and the pipe go, can go straight through. Uh, so that's just showing you those examples. Um, so I could have one that goes all the way through, straight on up, or I could do the flush mount. So I'm going to take one piece of PVC from the elbow to the top of this adapter. That's where I'm going to make my cut at. Then I'll put the coupler on. Then I'll put my second piece of PVC in. So this is one way where I got one piece of PVC here and then another one leaving, which is the recommended way. The other way was like this where it goes straight on through all the way. All right, two different ways you can do that, depending on your, your desire. You can also go out the sides of the unit, obviously, with both combustion or exhaust air. Uh, those same uh, adapter plates would be used on the left or right side of the unit as well. Um, and, and that adapter plate will also help you with the gasketing that's going to go on there to help seal the unit back up, and it'll help you with some weight support on the side of the sheet metal cabinet. Uh, I think we already covered um, enough of the, the venting. Obviously, the exhaust venting has to go all the way out of the units. The combustion air preferably comes from the outdoors, but if you're going to have it steal from the room, make sure you got one 90-degree elbow and then a foot of pipe on there to get some resistance. And then make sure you know where you're stealing your air from so you're not backdrafting water heaters and things like that. Here's a little bit better picture of that heat exchanger. Um, and then here's some zoomed up of how it actually goes. So the combustion products... Uh, the flame and combustion products are going to the top half of the aluminum luminized steel heat exchanger. Come on through here, give some of their heat up to these surface area plates, if you will. They make a 180-degree turn in this back box, which is inside of this guy over here on the left. They make the 180-degree turn and then go through each one of these individual tubes. Um, and those tubes have all these and those are stainless steel tubes, and they have aluminum fins on them over here to spread that heat out, and then it goes out into the collector box and on, it, on its way out uh, through the exhaust system. Inside each of those tubes, I don't know how well you can see it in the photo here, there's these little tabs you'll notice if you take the cover off. Those little tabs are for turbulators. You could pull those out and see that they're basically a, uh, a corkscrew wound piece of metal. Um, and the whole purpose of that is to turbulate the air. Um, if we have a straight tube and the air is going straight through it, it tends to be that um, the air on the outside of the tube, uh, touching the surface of the tubes, is doing most of the heat transfer and all of the air or fluid in the middle is just kind of sailing on through and not really giving any of this heat up to the outside of the tube. So putting those turbulators in there causes the air to move around more, which causes more of the air molecules to actually touch the outside of the tube and give their heat up to the heat exchange process. So basically putting those little turbulators in there is going to give us a um, little bit higher efficiency. Right. At this point with these units, when we're fighting to get 96, 97, 98 percent efficient, they're making lots of little tweaks to these things to get that. Because we're kind of at the theoretical maximum of a, of a gas burner appliance when we get to 98 percent here. So adding these little turbulators, adding fins to the tubes, uh, is all stuff we're doing to increase the heat transfer uh, possibilities of these units. All right, so the modulating gas bill on these units. Um, the uh, G9 MAE and his predecessor, the G9 MAC, would be the two that would have the modulating gas valve. Um, like I said before, they modulate from 40 to 100 percent of capacity in 1 percent increments. So the way I like to think of it and explain it to people is that it's a 61 stage gas valve versus one, two, or three stages that you would get from other previous types of products. The gas valve itself is a uh, 
is a uh, diaphragm style gas valve. It's fairly slow operating, which is what we want it to do so we can have better controllability over it. And you can run these furnaces on a regular thermostat if you want to and let the furnace decide how to modulate the gas valve. However, the better way to do it is to use the observer control, which I'll show you here in a little bit. The observer control is the communicating control. So instead of saying, I want cooling, or I want heating, or I want fan only, instead of him telling that to the furnace through the normal uh, Y, W, and G commands, uh, what he's going to do is he's going to send his temperature data over to the furnace. So he's going to go and tell him, hey, it's, uh, it's 72 degrees in here, and my set point is 71.3, so you need to start modulating down or modulating up or whatever it's going to be. Um, so the furnace can actually calculate how much heating capacity you need. If I just tell you I want heating, you don't know if I'm 2 degrees on a set point or from 20 degrees. You just know that I asked for heating. With a communicating control, the furnace will know exactly how far at a set point you are. And then as I'm getting closer to set point, let's say, for example, let's say, for example, the set point is 72 and it is 71 degrees in the house and I'm running the heat right now. As I'm getting warmer and warmer, it's going from 71 to 71.1, 71.2. And as I'm getting closer and closer to 72, what do you think that furnace is going to do? Just sit there and, and, and hold the fort? No, he's going to start backing the gas valve off. I don't want to get all the way up to set point and then have to shut the furnace off and then 10 minutes later start this whole process again. What I want to do is keep the heat running as long as I possibly can. Now, it's going to be a little bit counterintuitive, and we're going to explain that a little bit on how you talk to homeowners about that because they're going to hear, keep the heat running as long as possible. You're going to kill me on the gas bill. Um, but we're not running it at 100%, right? We're running it at 40, 50, 72, 91, whatever. We're running it at a specific percent. Um, so we're not going to be using more gas, and in fact, we're actually going to use less gas, and we'll explain that in a little bit. Um, so this guy is going to try to modulate the gas more or less to come right to the set point and then kind of hover there um, using as little gas as possible. That's going to be his goal in life, and I'm going to show you that in a little bit here. Let's just finish the last few uh, items on the furnace and service-oriented things, and then I'll talk a little bit about how we're going to communicate to homeowners modulating gas ideas. Um, the blower is on the bottom half of these units. Uh, it's very nice in that the blower is on a slide-out rail, slide-out chassis, if you will. Um, you basically just take a couple screws out from the left and right-hand side, and you can slide this motor out. Um, assuming you are uh, smart enough to give yourself a, enough extra uh, whip distance on your thermostat cable, you could slide this whole blower out with all the wires still connected and obviously the power shut off. Uh, take this whole blower out, set it down on the ground without taking a single wire off, and you can get up underneath the heat exchanger to see if you got anything plugged in there or to clean the heat exchanger or to service this motor better, things like that. Um, so it's very easy to do. And as most of you know, one of the problems you have with callbacks is something wasn't re-terminated on the wiring side like it should have been. So anytime I can avoid taking the wires off, it's probably going to be a good thing for me to reduce my callbacks. So give yourself a couple extra feet on the thermostat wire when you install it, and then you'll have enough thermostat wire and electrical wiring connection to slide this whole thing out without taking any wires off. Um, there are some options available for these units um, that do not come in the loose part bag. One of those I already mentioned was the internal venting kit. If you want the ventilation, the uh, exhaust PVC to cut back through the blower housing, you need the ventilation kit. Another kit that's available for it is a propane conversion kit. So if you are in a uh, slightly more rural area that doesn't have natural gas and your customers use propane, uh, there is a propane conversion kit for these guys. Um, so if you need info on that, um, we can get that for you, and the kits are backwards compatible to some of the older units, um, so you don't have to have as many of these in stock kind of thing. Um, you're basically changing out some pressure switches and uh, and uh, and manifold. Um, so, but on the bottom is showing you what you're actually going to be changing on this guy. Uh, there's also a mobile home kit. Um, it is only available for the. Uh, the single stage gas furnaces, not for the two stage or the modulating, um, but if you want to adapt the, uh, the N9 uh, series of single stage furnaces or the um, or the 96% G9 furnace to a mobile home, there's a kit you can get for that, which once again revolve, involves um, changing out the gas valve and applying some new labeling and stickers to the unit. All right, so the motors themselves, I mentioned there was three types of motors that we use. There is the variable speed ECM motor that we use on the two top tier units. There is the multi-tap ECMs that we use on the two middle tiers. And then there's the PSC blowers that we use on the two entry-level tiers. Um, 
The PSC blower is pretty straightforward. It's like most furnaces that you've worked with in the past. Uh, the ones we use are actually a four-speed motor, but we're only actually using two of the speeds at any given time. Basically, it's one speed for cooling airflow, one speed for heating airflow, and that's it. Um, the reason that there's more speeds available is that you can move um, you can move over to different speed taps if you need to to change your airflow for your specific application. So we don't control the speeds dynamically. We can change them once at the startup point, but then they're still only going to be operating either in the heating speed or the cooling speed. The ECM motors, these multi-tap ones, they're actually five-speed motors, and we're actively using three of the speeds. Once again, there's extra speeds available in case I need to switch and, and do a little bit different airflow for my application. But we're actively using three of the speeds. Uh, this kind of shows you how we're using it. So we got one of the airflows that we're going to use whenever the thermostat calls for um, two stages of cooling. I'm going to go to this airflow, which on this particular description up here, it's going to be the gray wire, right? The color of the wires doesn't really matter for the purpose of our discussion today, but that's that's what it is. Then if I go to the um, single speed cooling, I will go down to the low speed, which is the red wire. Likewise, on the heating side, I have a heating airflow. If I go to two stages of heating, it'll be the blue wire and then medium speed, basically. If I go to one stage of heating, it'll be the red wire. And then return continuous fan will also be the red wire. So basically, I have one lower speed for continuous fan mode, first stage heat, and first stage cooling. They all share that speed. Then I go up to a higher speed if I have two stage heat, and then up to a, yet another higher speed if I have two stage cooling. That's my, my three speeds that are available to me there. All right, so that's kind of how that guy works. And the variable speed furnaces, they're going to adjust their speeds up and down based on, in the case of the modulating gas valve, based on demand um, in space as well as airflow needs. So they're going to be all over the board. Here shows you just a wiring example for that multi-speed ECM, which is for the middle two-tier style units. And as you can see, there are one, two, three, four, five, um, six wires on here, one of which is a common, which is the green wire, and the other five are for specific speeds. The board has the ability to send different signals out on these speeds to tell the blower motor what to do. That's basically how he's working. Uh, on the variable speed units, we don't use these speed taps. We have a communication signal that goes from the board to the uh, to the motor. All right. So this is a little bit different with these guys. Um, I'm not going to have time to bore you with all that. So just at a quick glance, I just wanted to give you a little bit a snapshot of what the motors do. So on the far right, where it says single stage PSC. The, the, the two N-series units, the N9MSE and N9MSB, are identical in this regard. Uh, the only difference is one's 92%, one's 95.5%. Other than that, they're identical units. Um, they're single stage, so they can be used with a thermostat with W, Y, and G connections. So heat, cool, and fan connections. R is obviously the hot. Um, they have regular PSC bloater, blowers. Like I said, they're four speeds. We're going to actively use two of those speeds. If I were to step up to the G9MXE, that is going to be the uh, the 96% single stage ECM furnace. So um, I still only have one W signal, but I have a W a Y2 in case I happen to have a two stage air conditioner, which I probably wouldn't have, but I could. It's going to be the five speed motor I talked about. We're going to use three of those speeds. Um, here's the two stage one, the G9 MXT. So I got W1 and W2. Um, so it's got, I can control more speed capacities related to my gas control. And I got my two variable speed furnaces, right, which are these two on the left here, the G9MAE and the MVE. Uh, they both have variable speed furnaces, uh, and they're going to be changing their airflow capacities based on how many stages of heating and cooling are calling or how far the gas valve is modulated, etc. There's a couple things I do want to point out. Any of the units that have an ECM, whether it's a five-speed ECM or a variable speed ECM, they also have a DHUM terminal on them. That DHUM terminal is to wire up to a dehumidification stat or to a uh, like a Honeywell Prestige that has a uh, dehumidification relay or a Venstar 1900 that has one or the observer communicating control. Um, so what's going to happen with these, these dehum terminals is if anything closes the contact to them, whether it's a stat or a humidif dehumidification stat, if it sees that dehum terminal and there's no call for regular Y1 cooling, it's going to say, okay, well, you're telling me it's too humid in your space and you want me to dehumidify, and there's no call for cooling right now, but I'm going to go ahead and turn the cooling on anyway, and then I'm going to lower it down to the lowest fan speed that I can safely lower it to, and with that, I'm going to try to do as much dehumidification as possible. So I'm going to force the cooling on and run that low airflow, um, 
the less airflow that I have, the more latent dehumidification basically that I'm going to do versus sensible straight up cooling that I'm going to do. So that's why it's going to do that. Um, the nice thing about the two um, the two uh, variable speed units that can use the observer control is I don't actually have to wire to that dehum terminal. I can do it over the regular observer communication wires and not have to do anything extra. Um, Bruce asks if a PCF, P, PSC motor can be temporarily used on an EMC control board and the official answer to that would be no, although most of you could probably figure out a few ways to bastardize that. Um, but generally speaking, if for some reason you decide you need to replace the ECM motor, you would repla be replacing it with the new ECM motor. You would not put the PSC motor on there. Um, from a technical standpoint, I don't see why you couldn't make it work, but the factory is not going to allow you to do that. Um, that's going to be the answer on that. Plus, the service department will yell at me. I'm just kidding. Actually, I'm not kidding. They will yell at me. Um, Pat is asking if the MAE and the MBE use the same blower motor. Uh, and the answer to that question is going to be no. Um, the G9 MAE uses what I would call a, um, what's the best way to say it, a two-way communicating motor, meaning that the furnace circuit board can communicate to the motor and tell it what to do. And the motor, motor can communicate back to the furnace circuit board and tell it what it's doing and seeing. Whereas the G9 MBE is a pulse width modulation variable speed motor, meaning that that guy can accept signals from the furnace board, but he has no ability to send any confirmation data back to him. Um, for most applications, it's not going to make a difference to you. Both of them do vary their speed, but because the modulating gas valve unit needs to also be able to get some data back from the motor about what kind of airflows are happening, uh, that's why that one has to be a little bit different motor. So, But for replacement purposes, these are two different motors that would be used on the MAE and the MVE, the two variable speeds. And you can see up top there, uh, it says ECM PWM, which is pulse width modulation, which is yet a whole other class in itself. Uh, but just for our purposes, that means it's one-way communicating to the motor, not two-way. So the, the stat, the observer control, and the furnace are two-way communicating, but from the furnace to the, its own internal motor is just one way communicating on that guy. All right, any more questions before we talk a little bit about the discussions we might want to have with homeowners? I realize I'm at my hour here, but I'm going to go ahead and just continue talking for like another five minutes or so just to kind of finish everything up and wrap all these concepts up with you guys. So uh, if you have to jump off, that's understandable. Um, you can watch the recorded ending of this later. But if you can stay with me for a little bit longer, I will be happy to continue describing everything. So some of you may have seen this chart before, and these just happen to be cities that I've looked up before for specific projects, so I threw them all up here. Obviously, other cities will be slightly different, um, but this just gives you an idea. Uh, and the reason why I want to throw this up here is to give you guys an idea of that even though it's freaking cold here in the Midwest, it's not cold all the time, right? So we like to think, you know, in, for example, in Chicago, we always think about these minus 5, minus 10 degree days. The guys up in Minneapolis are always thinking about their minus 15 degree design days and things like that. And we all you know, assume that that's how cold it is in the winter. The fact is that it's only that cold for a few hours each year. If even that, last year it didn't even happen for most of us, right? Um, so it's only really, really, really cold for a few hours of the year. Unfortunately, we kind of need to size your furnace for those really coldest days. Um, we don't want to operate it there. We just want that capacity to be there for the day that we need it. And the rest of the time, we really want our furnace to be much smaller. So here's a numeric way to look at that. Um, some of you may realize that there's 8,760 hours in a year, or maybe you didn't realize it, but now you know. Um, of those 8,700 plus hours a year in the Chicago, Wisconsin, northern Indiana type areas, um, southern Minnesota, like Minneapolis, between six and 6,500 of those hours a year, we are going to be between 30 and 65 degrees outside, right? I'm only talking about heating, so this whole chart is talking about 65 degrees outside and under. But between 30 and 65, and I'm going to use the Chicago example just to make it easier, but you can look at your own column for where you're at right now. So 6,000 hours, total heating, 4,500 of the 6,000, it's between 30 and 65 degrees outside. So 75% of the time, it's going to be above 30. I want to go a little further and look at between 20 and 65. It's 5,400 hours. So 90% of my winter in Chicago, it's between 20 and 65 degrees outside. Actually, 90% of my year. Um, 
I'm sorry, 90% of my winter, sorry. It's between 20 and 65 degrees outside. But we size furnaces here for zero, minus three. Some of you guys do minus 10, right? Well, we have to have that capacity for when it's really cold, but I don't want to operate there because my unit turns on, off, on, off, on, off. If you look at Minneapolis, same kind of thing, 6,500 heating hours a year, 5,000 of them are above 20, so 77% of the hours, three quarters of the time, I'm, I'm above 20 degrees, right? So I don't need all that capacity. And even when I'm below 20, it's probably between zero and 20. It's probably not below zero, only for a few hours at night kind of thing, right? So I just want you to kind of think about that, that we don't need all the capacity all the time. Uh, if you want to look at it pictorially, this is the Chicago example showing you, if you look at it visually, if I grab my mouse right here at 65 degrees, all these lines on the left-hand side of this drawing are my heating. My cooling, by the way, is very small. So the cooling is a very minor piece of the market in the Midwest. Um, some of you guys in Kansas City, a little bit different answer to that. But for Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, heating is by far our dominant situation. Actually, it is in Kansas City, too, which is not as dramatic. All right, and you can see how many hours we spend at each one of these five-degree bands. If you look at the guys up in, in uh, Minneapolis, same kind of thing. All the stuff in red is my heating time. All the stuff in blue is cooling. And, yeah, I get down to, you know, minus 10, minus 15, minus 18 every once in a while. But look at the bulk of the hours. All these tall bars right here in the middle. That's when normally is happening. So I really want to control to this scenario, size for this really cold scenario, but control to this middle scenario. That's kind of my goal. The way we started doing this years ago is by providing multiple stages of heating capacity, either two or three stages of capacity. And back then, the way we used to sell this idea to homeowners was, hey, I got to give you this certain size furnace so when it's minus 10 degrees outside, I can heat your house. But we both know that most of the days in the winter, it's 20, 30, 40 degrees. So it would be really awesome if I somehow could put two furnaces in your house, one big one and one little one, and then give you the amount of heat that you need all the time, right? And we kind of showed it to them this way. So, you know, all these ones in the little blue flames here, that's what's happening most of the time. Then when it's really, really cold, I'll bring on the big furnace kind of thing, right? This guy right here. Well, same kind of concept now, but instead of just talking about two stages, I'm going to talk about 61 stages. I basically have a stage of capacity for every degree of outdoor air temperature that you might need, right? So exactly how cold is it outside that's exactly how much heat I'm going to give you now keep in mind we're not actually controlling the furnace staging based on the outdoor air temperature we're controlling it based on indoor temperature but the indoor temperature is significantly influenced by how cold it is outside so I basically have enough capacity to do the coldest day of the year or I can turn it down and not use as much capacity when you don't need it very similar to if you know you're cooking on a stove right you can turn the burner on to high fire and use that to boil your water but then as I get the water closer and closer to the temperature I want, I don't usually want to keep the flame on high fire. I start turning it down. I turn the valve down by hand. The same thing is going to happen with this furnace. I can run it high fire when I need to because I want to boil the water really fast, or in this case, heat your house really fast. But then as your house starts getting warmer and warmer and closer to the desired set point, right, or as the water starts boiling in the pot of water, I want to turn down that flame and not provide you as much heat. Just give you enough heat to keep it the temperature you want, right? That's kind of my goal with this guy. Looking at it on the graph, um, this bottom here is the outdoor air temperature from minus 10 to 80 degrees. Up the left is BTUs for someone's house from 0 to 65,000. So this guy's house needs 65,000 BTUs on a minus 10 degree day. So I could plot that point here. If I then redid his load calculation and said that he doesn't need minus 10, he only needs 55 degrees, plotted it on this end, I could draw a line between those two. This black line represents how much heat this guy needs at his house at any given time. So if I look at 20 degrees outside, boom, 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 this guy needs, whatever, 38,000 BTUs heat. If it's 10 degrees outside, he needs 50. If it's minus 10, he needs 65. If it's 50 degrees outside, he basically needs nothing, right? So I can see what your house needs at any given moment in time. The modulating gas valve, his job in life is to track that black line. He wants to provide you the exact amount of heat that you need at all times. He basically wants to run all the time and never shut off. That would be the perfect scenario. Never shut off. Um, I'll provide you less heat, right? I'll turn down and give you less and less and less, but I don't want to shut off. Now, at some point, it's going to get to be so warm outside that I've modulated my valve from 100% all the way down to the 40% minimum, and I can't go any lower than that. So then at that point, in this case, it probably happens at 50 degrees, for example, then I got to shut it off. But even then, I'm shutting it on and off between 0, 40,000, 0, or excuse me, 0, what is it on this guy's house, 15,000, 0, 15,000, or 40%, 0%, 40%, 0%, 40%. Right, a normal furnace would be going 0, 100, 0, 100. I'm only going to um, stage on and off from 0 to 40. But then when it gets cold enough, and at this guy's house, that's going to happen at 
45, 50 degrees, when it gets cold enough, I'm going to run the burner all the time. So in his house, when it's below 45 degrees, I'm never going to shut off the gas valve. Now, there's three times that it does shut off. That's when it gets so mild outside that I can't modulate down enough. That's one time. The other um, time is going to be that when I tell tell my thermostat, I walk up to it and I say, you know what, I don't want 72 anymore. I want I want 68 degrees in here. And it says, but it's already 71.9, Ryan. What, that's not going to be good. He'll start modulating down and then he'll have to shut off. So if I manually change the set point, he'll have to shut off. The third time he'll do it is if I put in a time schedule and I say, hey, it's 72 degrees is my set point, but at nighttime at 11 p.m. I want to go down to 65. When 11 p.m. comes, it says, okay, time to switch to 65. Oh, but wait, it's already 72 in here. I better start modulating down. He'll modulate down and shut off. Those are the only three times you want that gas valve to shut off. Other than that, this thing should be on all the time. Um, now, some of your consumers will be a little scared about that, and they'll think they're going to waste a bunch of gas. The best way i found to explain it to people, and you could probably think of your own analogies, but the way I've explained it is like the garden example, I call it. So if I have this garden in my backyard, and my garden, let's say it needs five gallons of water a day, I could go out there, stand with the hose in my hand, dump five gallons of water right in a big puddle on top of the garden, and let it all soak in, right? I can dump five gallons of water there for five minutes. Or I can buy one of those nice little soaker hoses with little perforated holes in it. You guys have seen those that missed out. All right, put that on there, turn my water on, and let that five gallons supply my garden for the next hour, right? So I can give you five gallons in five minutes, or I can give you five gallons over the course of the hour. In which way did I buy more water? Hopefully you're all saying, well, in both cases, you bought five gallons of water, Ryan. It's the same price. The same thing happens with the gas. I can either give you all the gas really quick for five minutes in your face and give you 125 degree air blasting at you, or I can give you, turn down, modulate the gas down and give you less gas for the whole hour and only supply 110 so you're not overcooking, right? And how much gas did I end up buying? The same, because the amount of gas I need to buy, the amount of therms I buy is a direct function of my heat loss. So it's not a function of how I control the unit, it's a function of my heat loss. Um, so it doesn't cost me any more gas to modulate the gas valve down and provide you continuous, comfortable heat throughout the course of the entire hour. Just like it doesn't cost me any more water to use the soaker hose than it does to dump it in a big puddle. And by the way, which one's better for the garden? The soaker hose or dumping it in a big puddle where half of it evaporates off, right? So the modulation is a much better way to do it here. Uh, the benefits of the modulation are longer, gentler heating cycles. If we keep that thing running all the time, you have the same discharge air coming out of your diffusers. You have the same discharge air coming out of your diffusers. You don't get a cold draft, warm, cold, warm. You don't get that. We don't want to blast you with 125 degree air and then 70 degree neutral air then 125.70. That's stupid. I'd rather just give you a consistent 105, 110 all the way through or whatever it takes to heat your house. Um, get a much better distribution of heating throughout the house. So if you have some problem zones like the infamous bonus room over the garage, well, uh, that room, like in my house, I got a bonus room over the garage. My, happens to be my, my youngest kid's bedroom. Heat turns on. All the heat goes out the duct. He's doing his job. He's heating. He's heating. That duct work happens to be in the ceiling of the garage where it's already pretty cold, so it takes very long for that, that duct in my kid's room to heat up. But by the time that duct heats up and starts tweaking out a little bit of hot air, my furnace is already off because the thermostat in the other room already told the furnace to shut off. Well, if I have a modulating gas furnace, my gas is not turning off, and it's pretty much staying on all the time, although it reduced capacity, that duct's not getting cold. It's always staying warm, and there's always some heat going into that room. So it does help even out some of the hot spots, cold spots. Very similar to what you guys started doing when we started using variable speed furnaces and running them continuously to kind of even things out on the airflow side. Same thing happening with the gas valve here. We want to run the gas valve continuously just like we do the fan to even things out. Uh, and then the sound level would be much better because it would be very, very rare for me to run it at 100% capacity. It would have to be minus 10. If it's not minus 10, this thing never runs at 100% gas. If it's never at 100% gas, the inducer motor never goes to 100%, nor does the blower motor. So if I keep all three of those things turned down and almost never run them at 100%, you don't have to ever hear your furnace. Whereas if you've got a two-stage furnace, every time it goes to second stage, then everything's got to speed up accordingly. My inducer speeds up to his second stage. My blower speeds up to his second speed. Everything speeds up and everything gets louder. With the modulating, I almost never have to hit the peak of, the, of any one of the fans, inducer or blower, so my sound level is typically lower. Uh, real quick, from a cost standpoint, um, I threw some furnaces up on here. The baseline furnace in this example that I'm comparing against was a 75% AFUE furnace, which is pretty typical, which you'll find in most existing homes. Even if they had an 80%, if it was 20 years old, it's probably operating at 68 to 75%. But for sake of this example, 75% was the baseline. 
Uh, I used 12 cents a kilowatt hour for the fan electric, and I used uh, 80 cents uh, per therm for the natural gas. Um, we can run examples for your specific specific market if your utility costs are different than that. But this is just to give you an idea. Um, so this first furnace here was an 80 percent, so we're upgrading them from a 75 to an 80 percent. It's basically going to save them 250 bucks a year in this case. And by the way, this had a very inefficient fan, so I ask a little fan penalty here too. Um, the second one here, the G9 MXT, um, this guy is a 96% uh, efficient furnace with a, a uh, uh, ECM um, five-speed motor on there, or three-speed, I should say, for our purposes. This guy is going to save me, uh, in this case, oh, this is not natural gas. I'm sorry, this is the propane example I'm showing you. I put the, the same picture on both. I apologize for that. Uh, the natural gas example should have been $672 of savings. Um, and then the variable, the modulating gas one was uh, $700. Um, so it was very different there. I'll have to fix that slide and then reshow that. Um, so let's look at the propane example just so we have a, a correct number to look at. Um, the propane, um, the, the uh, ECM um, two-stage gas unit, 96%, was um, saving me $1,200. The variable speed modulating gas was saving me $1,300. So the point here, and this is 100,000 BTUs, the point here on the, on the propane at uh, $1.80 um, per gallon, it's really only saving me like 80 bucks. And on the natural gas, it's like saving me 50 bucks, maybe 40 bucks, if it was the natural gas example. So the modulating gas unit does not save me that much more energy than the 96% um, the uh, ECM unit does. Right? I'm saving a little bit more because it's a little bit better, right? So instead of 96%, I have 97%. But some of the manufacturers out there will tell you, oh, it's modulating, so it's going to even be better. The AFUE number already accounts for the fact that it's modulating. So when I jump from 96 to 97 percent, that's just 1 percent. That's all I'm going to get. And the ECM motor is only like another 30 bucks. So when I jump from the ECM to the variable speed ECM, I save like another $30. It's not a big, huge number. All right, you can even see here, I saved 180 versus 203. So $33 on this furnace was all I saved on the electric side. So why am I telling you that? Am I trying to talk you out of it? No. I'm not. Uh, it's definitely the most efficient furnace that we got here. You know, it's 98% on one side, 97 on the others. You can't get more efficient than that. Um, but with that being said, you're probably not selling this furnace on efficiency alone. If they just want to get a nice, efficient furnace, you get this G9 MXT. It's good on the electric. It's good on the gas, 96%. It's fantastic. To get them to go to that one extra percent to pay a few hundred bucks more for it, they're going to have to be sold on the comfort idea. So the way you sell the modulating gas furnace is based on comfort and then energy efficiency comes along for the ride. If they just care about energy and they don't give a crap about comfort, then fine, just give them a 95 or 96% efficient furnace with an ECM and you're done, All right? That's what I kind of, kind of show here. I apologize that I got the wrong slide on the natural gas. I put the same, the same uh, graph up for both of them. Um, but the, 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 the theory is the same, is that you're only saving a little bit more by going to modulating gas. You need to have comfort as part of the discussion. All right, the last thing I'll leave you with is this observer control. Um, which is a whole other class in itself. Um, but this is really the way you need to use it. If you're going to do the modulating gas furnace, you really have to have this control. Um, you can bastardize and get it to work with a regular stat if you want to, but there's really no benefit in buying the modulating gas furnace and not buying the modulating controller that goes with it. There's a couple nice things about this. The first thing is it's a communicating stat, and it only needs four wires. Regardless of the fact that this is a 61-stage gas furnace, there's four wires. There's two communicating wires, and two power wires, and that's it. And with those four wires, you get two stages of cooling capacity control, full modulating gas valve control, full blower speed control, uh, humidity stat for your humidifier, dehumidification stat, all going over those four wires. So it's a very nice installation. It's very simple. The other cool thing about it is this stat, when you hook it up and power it up, he goes out and starts interrogating devices that are on his communication cable. So he goes out and looks for a furnace. And that furnace circuit board knows his information. He knows what size he is. He knows what his capacities are. He interrogates these devices, finds out, oh, I got a, I got a G9 uh, MAE furnace of 80,000 BTUs, blah, blah, blah. And then he goes and proceeds to configure all the settings for that furnace and his airflow. All you've done is wired it up and powered it, and he's already configuring that. He does the same thing with the condensing unit if it's communicating. He'll interrogate that, figure out what his sizes and capacities are, set up the furnace airflows to match along with the capacities that are needed for airflow on that condensing unit. All that's happening without you moving any dip switches or jumpers or speed taps or any of that business. 
The stat does all that stuff for you. It's a very cool stat. From the consumer standpoint, on the margin and gas furnace, you really got to have to. You have to have it um, because, you, like I said, you want the furnace to know exactly how far I am for, from set point so I can use that to tweak the gas valve. If all of it, all the, st the furnace knows is W1 and W2, you basically made your modulating gas furnace a two-stage unit, which is pretty lame. Uh, if you want to get the full modulating benefit, you need to use this control with that furnace. Um, but that's a whole other topic for another day. If you got questions on it, you know, ask us and, and we'll, we'll help you out with it. But I just wanted to kind of tie it in here because it really is important to use it with that furnace. Uh, like I said, this is the first uh, 2013 webinar for Excelsior. Um, the next webinar will be February 25th. It'll be on indoor air quality using APCO products. Uh, APCO is uh, an air purification product that we install in the supply duct, mostly of residential systems, also with some light commercial stuff. Um, and Greg Jutris, our IAQ expert, is going to handle that topic. And then in March, we're going to show you a residential load calculation program that is free um, and very quick to use. It takes me about five to seven minutes to do a load calc on someone's house, and it's pretty accurate. So um, stay tuned for those those topics coming up, and you can see there's more topics throughout the year. Uh, if you want to register for these as they become available, uh, the website is excelsiorhvac.com, and you click on the training button, um, and then you'll click on the webinars button, and you'll see all the webinars coming up. Um, so these all all these aren't posted on there yet because some of them are far out into the future. But you'll see the ones that are posted on there. You'll also see any webinars that any of our manufacturers, such as Honeywell, uh, are hosting uh, in the upcoming months as well. Uh, so I direct you to that. But every, mon every fourth Monday of the month from 4 to 5 p.m., we have a specific webinar topic. All right. Does anybody have any further questions that I need to go check over here? Let me look at the question tab. I don't see any other questions. I do apologize for going 20 minutes over, but hopefully, well, the guys that are still on here, obviously you got something out of the extra 20 minutes. Otherwise, you would have already logged off. Um, and then this is a recorded presentation, and I'm going to post the recording tonight before I leave the office. So you should be able to get to it. It's the same link that you registered originally is the link for it. And it will also be shown on the Excelsior training website, the link to the recorded version. So if you got someone else in your office who needs to see it, you can certainly do that. Um, with that, I thank you guys for your time, and uh, I'm going to stay on the line for just a minute or two in case somebody does type a question in, but then other than that, I'm going to go ahead and shut her down. All right, good evening.